disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. This is the end. The end of a decade that has delighted us with many amazing discoveries. This is the end of a year that has yielded more answers and unveiled more mysteries. This is the end of another 52 episode season that has taken us to the outer limits of our solar system. Explored the inner mechanics of our minds, delved into the microbial world within and the ancient universe beyond. A season that brought us closer to an understanding of everything. Uh, then, uh, at least closer than uh, we began the year with. For those of you who have been on this journey with us, tighten your chin straps. There's more adventure ahead on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only Dance, one Greg. place to Dance. go to find Dance. the knowledge I see. This is the part that this week in science for famous dance. What's happening? What's happening? This week in science. What's happening? Kiki and Greg. Good science, Justin. Yeah, Greg so Yen is visiting us. Do you Greetings, know what this all. means? Greetings. Fresh Do you know what out this the way means? back machine. Yeah. <laughs> He's even got the Doctor Who scarf. It's the only way to travel through time. I'm trying to be energy efficient, and I do so by keeping my house cold. <laughs> very good. Very good. It's a good plan. We, we approve. Everybody out there. This is Twiss, This Week in Science. We're celebrating this week. This week is our 300th episode. And in honor of that, we, we've, we've gone into the Wayback Machine. I used my telephone. Well, it's, you know, now a mobile media device. Um, and I contacted Greg Yen, past host of This Week in Science from about 2000-ish to 2004 or so. The memory banks are a little fuzzy these days, and and he's going to he's going to hang out with us for the hour. I'm so excited! Thank you so much for for joining in. Oh, the really honor is all mine, completely mine. So I'm happy to be here, and I congratulate you guys on a uh, show number 300. That's tremendous. Thank you. You were part and of well. You were part no, of no, the meetup. The, the, the caveat is there's like yeah, you're part of the 300 plus that predated these 300. Yes. <laughs> you're, like, you're like BC. You're like part of the 300 BC. BC, and then this, yeah, during the, yeah, during the Gibson era, so. Yes. <laughs> yes, the William Gibson era. It would, I think it would be the BP, before podcast. Yes. <laughs> we started this and, uh, and, and podcasting was not, not even created at that point. So tremendous that it, you've spanned all media now. Yeah, yeah we back, try. In, back in those days, if you were streaming, it meant something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> something only Justin would know about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, everyone, for today's show in uh, celebration of the 300, it's also um, time for our annual countdown show. So today we're going to be not bringing you our normal weekly science news. We're counting down 2010. It's our last show of the year, and uh, we have 11 stories, 11 big stories of 2010, the top 11 stories of 2010 to cover in this hour. So uh, should we get on to it? Justin, why do we cover 11 stories? Well, Instead because the ultimate media out there that's covering stories is uh, counting down the top 10 stories of the past year. And uh, we don't want to leave our fans uh, wondering what was that one more story they could have gotten. So we do a top 11. What is what is that story? <gasps> oh, that story is Lancet Retractions. That's number 11. Yep, it sure is. Picked. Picked is number 11. In the beginning of the year, around February, the Lancet, a well-known uh, scientific medical journal, uh, retracted a story that linked autism and the MMR vaccine. 
Should have happened sooner, but it happened this year. It happened in 2010, and it's a pretty big deal that that retraction actually happened. That was the journal being part of the scientific community actually stepping out and saying, eh, this, this story was a bunch of confabulation and deceit. So it's a pretty big deal, and it happened this year. Any thoughts, anybody? Anybody? Well, it's amazing to me that that's actually uh, the the Lancet is still getting this kind this kind of heat that they haven't sort of cleaned up their act. Um, Lancet was under a lot of heat uh, the previous year for publishing uh, industry created uh, science uh, without reveal. In fact, they were they were under a lot of uh, controversy for having a pay to print policy for a number of their publications. Um, it's kind of, it's pretty sad that they're still having these kinds of issues, but I honestly, in researching any story, I, to this day, if it has, if it's attached to the Lancet, I have question marks about the legitimacy of it. And that's how, that's how detrimental to it. The largest publisher, one of the largest publishers of scientific material is that when, when these sort of things start to happen, you have to question everything then that comes from them. Well, I think that the um, the biggest deal is is the fact that this was used as um, as leverage to to reject vaccinating uh, kids, especially in Britain, and uh, that they saw uh, their measles rates uh, increase dramatically uh, when people started citing this particular study in the Lancet as a reason to not vaccinate their children for fear of autism and here in the United States the you know the same study has often been cited as as a rationale for not vaccinating kids um, with the MMR uh, vaccination here and and that's a big problem and can lead to you know rampant spread of these these diseases like uh, measles isn't cool mumps isn't cool rubella not cool so um, it, the fact that this really affected children's health in in not just a small amount of children, but a lot of children in, you know, a mm -hmm. first world industrialized nation is also quite, quite surprising. So in addition to the Lancet really being on trial here as, as a place where you can get reputable uh, science uh, journalism or, or um, science that has been vetted, it, the, you know, this really affected kids too. And that's, that's a big shame. So absolutely and, agree and yeah, the fact the, that and, and the fact that it could overshadow even all the evidence that uh, autism is genetically uh, derived genetically linked is it, it it is surprising that this study could have been published in that form yeah yeah unfortunately not retracted years ago um and it had to, you know it's been what more than 10 years since the story was uh, originally yeah. published and it's been floating around there uh, giving life to all sorts of people that are anti-vaccine and it really puts lots and lots of kids at risk even kids that are vaccinated so it's just a it's a egregious error by the lancet so absolutely and maybe the retraction is a little too little too late to uh, actually fix all the ramifications that have occurred as a result. Um, but that's, you know, the bad news for the year. It's We're glad that they retracted it, finally. Um, hope, hopefully, we will see more vaccinations, uh, the, the vaccination rates increasing over time. Maybe 2011 will be the year of more vaccinations. Who knows? Number 10? Into number, number 10? Number 10! That's right. Microbes, microbes everywhere. Microbes were found by SETI researchers in a uh, the water of an area called Lost Hammer, which is a spring on Canada's Axel Heiberg Island. Lost Hammer, the water contains bubbles of methane that rise to the surface, produced by little tiny microbes living in the frozen pool. Frozen pool cold very cold microbes are living in this frozen area and are uh, they're not using oxygen they're anaerobic bacteria that utilize methane uh, as a source of energy and carbon utilizing methane this uh, this finding suggested that similar life could have evolved on mars which is very a very interesting idea and a hypothesis that I'm sure researchers are following up. Additionally, 
Me uh, microbes found living without oxygen, oxygen depleted water at the bottom of the Mediterranean Ocean. And, um, you know, we're, we're finding them in, in the most interesting, toxic, uh, what we would think of as toxic or not very life, life supporting environments. Um, and uh, another story that I thought was really neat in terms of where we find microbes and how important they are. Microbes in our gut. This year has been a, a year of interesting stories for our internal intestinal microbiome and how every person has a very unique ecosystem of microbes that uh, are involved in your health. And one of my favorite stories that come out this year was the one that you did just recently about how the uh, compatibility between your microbes and somebody else's microbes may lend to their attractiveness towards you. <laughs> I know my microbes like your microbes. <laughs> that could be the Want to go out? <laughs> <laughs> it's really, we're just here to help the microbes date. <laughs> just yeah. they're here to facilitate. Well, and even in the atmosphere. It would be a shame if you, if you and your partner started kissing and because of a microbial difference, you both started vomita vomiting simultaneously. <laughs> so these things are, are important. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't actually considered that. But if you're yeah, I, who wants microbial rejection? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awful. So, her microbes didn't like my microbes. <laughs> but uh, this year, I think there were just there were tons of microbe stories, you know, all over the place. We we're finding, uh, you know, last year, every year there's more and more information about the microbes in our world, where they exist, how they exist, and how how integrated they are into our ecosystems, into our lives, into our into our world, our health. Um, and I just I look forward to so much more information on this. I mean, microbial genetics and uh, and biology is a huge field right now. It's just it's just blossoming. Moving on, number nine, is it time? Number nine, solar <laughs> ships. Yeah, solar ships. Do you remember these studies from this year, Justin? Oh. There was a, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> the, these ones were really interesting. There were uh, two completely separate events. One is a, there's, a, there's a spaceship with a solar sail. And uh, it was the very, they, they launched this spaceship. They got it uh, out into space and it's a success. The very first journey of a solar sail spacecraft has worked. And that happened this year. Additionally, there's a, uh, there was a solar powered plane that flew for 24 hours uh, with, without stopping, without using a drop of fuel, completely solar powered. It, the plane was called Solar Impulse. That was um, this year? That was this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, for some reason, I thought it already happened like a long time ago. Is that an image from Tron that just came up? <laughs> <laughs> Very possibly. I missed it. I missed the image. Yeah, but I uh, I think that the this year, the, the solar, uh, just the... The work that people are doing coming to a head on uh, using alternative power, uh, specifically the sun in these cases, and very successfully to power vehicles, one for uh, planetary air flight and another for space travel. is it, It's just uh, amazing that these technologies that we've been talking about and thinking about for so long, I mean, Solar solar sailed spacecraft have been in science fiction for for just years, and you know to see that finally come to fruition this year was uh, is pretty exciting. Yeah, always the realm of of science fiction and speculation. Um, the it was JAXA, the Japanese uh, space agency, which launched uh, Icaros, which was the the solar sailor that actually worked in the. Uh, then NASA launched uh, their solar sailor, uh, the NanoSail D, um, just this last November, which was folded up inside of their satellite, and they haven't been able to make contact with it, so they're not sure <laughs> if it's actually working a little bit of a setback there for solar sailing. But very cool that you can use pressure created by the sun um, to and, and sail along that. It's, it's awesome. I think that would appeal, especially to you, Kirsten, with your sailing background. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, here the wind is just, uh, it is basically second generation solar energy. Um, but out in space that that's really, truly a, a real solar wind that would be pushing a solar sail. And yeah, I'd love to sail the intergalactic seas. I like the idea. <laughs> let's let's do it. Yes. Uh, I, I don't I don't know how how good it would operate. I mean, intergalactically, it seems like there'd be a pretty awful doldrum out there potentially. Probably when you hit the uh, the the heliopause, uh, the edge of our our solar system, like Voyager just hit just get, yeah. the edge of our solar system. They've got there's a, a lack of the solar wind there, so maybe not intergalactic, but maybe. Um, interest solar system yeah yeah it'd be a nice travel. way to hop around yeah do some planet hopping with it absolutely yeah but i feel I, a lot better about that than i do like putting nuclear materials up on a rocket yeah nukes in space though Meh. <laughs> there's bigger, like there's bigger and more dangerous things out there no, once they're out there i'm okay i think it's fine once it's out there once the nukes uh, nuclear powered uh, engines once that material is out there no problem it's the getting it up safely. That's why if we can like go to Mars and or the moon and mine radioactive materials for spaceships, perfect. That's that's what we need to find. We need a uranium mine on Mars, and I'm I'm all for it. It's that whole with the atmosphere and the radiation and things. A scaredy cat. I know I'm a chicken. Although really, I guess the coal powered uh, coal fired power plants put up enough uh, nuclear material as it is. It probably wouldn't make any difference. If one yeah, did blow up in the atmosphere. If you just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science. Dr. Kiki here with Justin Jackson and Greg Yen. A blast from the past from Twiss's, Twiss's memory banks. Let's move it on up, everybody. It's time for number eight. Number eight. Visions of the universe. The universe That's as we can now see it. Yeah, there's some just amazing, the instruments that are uh, available to us are, are bringing us just amazing images of the universe. Um, this year, some just incredible images from the Cassini mission of um, Saturn's moons, Titan and Enceladus. Um, just absolutely gorgeous, striking images that uh, I think... I think open up our imaginations and uh, you know our 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 thoughts about what's out there and and what we're looking at and our awareness of our of our universe. Um, and then the Planck or Planck Planck telescope, um, the Planck telescope gave us a map of everything, not just a planet and its moons, but everything. <laughs> The uh, the European Space Station has released this this map. It's in 13.7 billion years ago. The, it's a picture of the universe. Little just baby after, universe. We're a little, little baby light. Yeah, just after it was born. It was. It looks like it was a pretty place, even though probably not very hospitable back in those days. But it was pretty. It's nice. I like it like it but um these images are are just the beginnings of as we get more and more instruments more and more probes out into space focusing our sights ever outward with higher and higher resolution um you know the way the camera that cameras are advancing these days uh we're benefiting from lots of uh, you know we're benefiting these images on the telescopes and various things um are, are leading to some of the stuff that we get in our own camera technology for the cameras that we use for point and click, 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 click. But really the stuff that they're putting out there in space is so much more advanced. And as the years go forward, it's it's just gonna become more so. Very cool. Uh, any thoughts before we move on? Uh, no, it's just, it's. I'm, just, I'm staring, I'm like dumbfounded at this picture that I'm looking at of, of the, uh, one of the photos from the, the Planck Space Telescope and, and just how, how gorgeous it is and how crazy it is that you can look back in time almost 14 billion years uh, to when the universe was very, very young and very hot and, yeah. and actually get a picture of that. And that's, that's insanity to me. 
on Ocean. And the picture is so much out. nicer than the the previous one they had because the previous one was like a looked like a light bright, <laughs> 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 just had like red and blue, just blotchy dots all over and yeah. you couldn't really make you couldn't really tell what you were even trying to see and the new photographs are sort of a higher resolution more detailed and, and the data that they've gotten back they're much more impressive yeah just the fact that we're putting more telescopes out in space um outside of our atmosphere which uh, disrupt op optics and everything like that and then and getting these stunning images just shows that it's it's all worthwhile. So. It does. That was one of the most amazing uh, things I, I heard. It was, I think, the astronaut who was tweeting down to Earth. Uh, that, was that? Um, I can't remember the cat's name. But he was doing uh, live tweets from space and fielding questions and stuff. And one of the things that he pointed out was that in space, the stars don't twinkle. That there isn't there isn't that twinkling effect that we see from here, and in fact they're not all sort of uh, uh, bluish uh, hued, or they they have actually a lot of specific colors to the different stars that you can see once you're once you're beyond just our you know 50 mile up atmosphere. Yeah. So it is quite quite a different view from just not that far away. <laughs> Yep. All right, everybody. Number. What number is it? Number seven. Number seven. This is prostheses. Prostheses. If I were from from Spain, prostheses. Prosthetics. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> this year had some really, really um, just amazing advancements adv advancements in prosthetics. Uh, this fall, just a few months ago, Berkeley Bionics uh, presented their e-legs, which are exoskeleton legs that have allowed people to walk again. Uh, basically, uh, taking instructions from a couple of, uh, of, of, um, of arm, what are the crutches of a cr couple of crutches and the movement of the crutches then sends instructions to the exoskeleton legs that move the people's legs and allow paralyzed individuals to walk. Uh, just an amazing advancement. Uh, hopefully we'll be helping many, many people in the years to come uh, overcome disability uh, that has come for whatever reason and, and restore movement to, to people. It's just a, if you haven't taken a look uh, at, at Berkeley Bionics and what they're doing, I definitely, definitely suggest taking a look. Um, additionally, restoring vision to the blind. There are several teams that this year have uh, have announced their, their work and what they're doing. A couple of these teams, there's an MIT group and another group called Second Sight who I think are linked to Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And they're working on retinal implants that uh, rely on sunglasses with a camera that send images to a retinal implant that then will, uh, will signal electronically, sig send signals to uh, the retina or to the nerves that go into the, the optic nerve and then to the visual cortex to allow people to see. Uh, Retina Implant also is that there's another company, Retina Implant. They're in Germany, and they're not. They've they've come up with a technology that doesn't involve the glasses with the camera. They're implanting stuff directly into the eye, and uh, they've they've restored the sight of three people, and they're looking for uh, looking to start human trials, further human trials since they've done their pilot trials and they were really successful uh, in 2011. So there's some really amazing, you know, restoring sight, restoring movement. Prosthetics are just getting better and better and better. And and being somebody who, you know, doesn't really need those prosthetics, I, I still kind of want them, you know, like. Because, <laughs> you know, why, why not uh, apply it to healthy people, too? It means I could run faster, perhaps jump higher. You know, maybe I could have uh, even better vision. I could see in perhaps, you know, the infrared. This, yeah, there's a lot of things that we can do to, to to do some mods with this stuff that could be fun. Plus, there's also in the non prosthetics. This was uh, we can celebrate the third double hand transplant occurred this year. Oh, did of it? actual yeah of actual taking hands and wow. putting them where there weren't any and putting hands on there. 
that were non-prosthetic but uh, organic and were not rejected. That's impressive. That, that, that is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some of the videos of uh, and stories of some of the, one of the persons that re received a double hand transplant and what he has to do in terms of physical therapy and recovery. And it's not an easy road to walk down mm -hmm. at all. Um, but uh, well, I you shouldn't just, try walking on his hands for, for one thing. I mean, no, not for a while, not until those, you get those stitches out, but it, yeah, I think that, that looks like the picture of the gentleman having a real difficult time adapting to it um, and, and making it work. But it's just, it's amazing that medicine has come that far. I mean, face transplants done in France not too long ago. Now we're at hand transplants. That's that's even cooler in some ways. So. <laughs> and the, even then cooler. the big one, you know what the oh, big no. one's going to be? What? <laughs> You know, the big one, you j it's a full body transplant. <laughs> body transplant. <laughs> that's how we're going to find it. That's how we're finally going to live the forever. We're going to, you know, there are going to be human farms out there, you know, whoever mm -hmm. whoever has the, the motorcycle accident or whatever. Bodies, uh, bodies in good enough tack, but they, you know, they weren't wearing the helmet or what have you. Hey, they were 30. I'm now 60. Why not? Take off my head, put it on that younger body and away you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, in, in 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 other kind of prosthetics, the the advancement of robots as well. I mean, maybe we could put our heads on a robotic body as opposed to oh, yeah. a human body. I mean, why why have have the limitations of humanity? You when you can have a robot. They this year also there was the advancement of robot skin that could feel the light touch of a butterfly. Mm -hmm. so, See, that's, uh, that's where I was about to go with that, too. It's like, yeah. robot body sounds good, stronger, more durable. The, the maintenance requirements are a little probably easier at this point. But uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's an element of being human that I really enjoy that uh, has to do with the sensation of touch. If a robot can give me that, then uh, robot body gives me that, then I think I might be in. Yeah, I'd be in. Okay. <laughs> we'll go you might be grounded, it. though. I don't think TSA would let you through security with a robo body. So, just oh, yeah. To keep in mind, you, you might have to fly special robo airlines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, well, we, yeah well, you know, that's what would happen, though. We'd have to start this whole sort of separate society. We'd have to have the Android League of sports. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know the, yep. and then someday eventually the the android league would become popular enough and then you know you'd have the the first android player to to join the you know mainstream uh pro professional sports and do so well that that one android would then have opened the floodgates for uh androids <laughs> everywhere to play professional sports and then one day you'll look at the you know it'll be like Oh, it's like 90% uh, androids playing the sport, but how come there's no android coaches? <laughs> <laughs> I like how you bring this all back to uh, fantasy sports. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Oh, and it's, it's just been heartache this year. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We got to get to our last, last story. We got to get through six for our first half of the show. So we're on number six. Number six. No, story number six. Big physics! Yeah, we like big physics and we cannot lie. LHC <laughs> has been giving us some big news this year. I know last year it was all, what's going to happen with the LHC? What's it going to do? What are we going to find? And this year... How did a loaf of bread take it down? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That was 2009. 2010, no errant loaves of bread. <laughs> but actually... <laughs> We have data, folks. We have liftoff. Uh, the Hadron Collider got going. It's been going with a big bang ever since. Moving moving protons together at 99% the speed of light. They've made the switch now from protons to heavy lead ions, getting results from those ions. And the ALICE experiment announced its first, ex its first uh, results from the nuclei collisions. And uh, what was it? Quark soup? Nice liquid from the Alice experiment in the LHC. Yeah. We had a yeah, had... hinting that the early universe may have been a liquid ball of stuff. <laughs> yeah, a really hot liquid ball. 
liquid plasma ball of stuff. But uh, yeah, this year's been a big year for the LHC. Big physics. Um, <laughs> additionally, antimatter atoms were stored for the very first time. Not matter, antimatter. Antimatter, which normally blinks out of existence because it runs into matter because there's so much matter around that it can't help it. Runs into matter, poof, no more antimatter. They trapped some. They made it really, really, really cold and were able to trap, what was it, like 36 antimatter? or something like that. Yeah. It was 38 and then they blew up a couple bits <laughs> of it just to show that it was there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> we have to destroy some just so we can prove that we got it. Well, isn't that the only way to detect it is to let it run into some normal matter and then interact and then we know that there was antimatter there? Exactly. Exactly. That's the only way. You have to destroy it to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I love that experiment. And, it, you know, it, it might very well might uh, allow us to do more trapping of antimatter, find out more about this dis <laughs> discrepancy between matter and antimatter in our universe. Um, and then th this last kind of, this is a big physics idea more than big physics, uh, like big experiment going on. Um, the question that came up this year, there were some results from a study that suggested physical laws that we take for granted to be the same across our entire universe might vary from place to place. Kind of mind-bending. Could throw the entire field of physics into an upheaval if it- Unless if it you've read out. my book. In which case, it was predicted already. <laughs> right. You and predicted. in fact, there are, there, it, and, it, and it has to do with whether or not, yeah, with the actual structure of the universe. And we've had guests uh, who've come on too, um, who have talked about the potential for the speed of light, while the light itself is sort of at, at a constant, the speed of light traveling throughout the, the universe might not be the same every, everywhere. So there have been, yeah. uh, there have been some sort of uh, contesting viewpoints on this for a while now. But yeah, LHC has given some examples for us that uh, are, are pretty mind-bending. It's, it's sort of evidence that that's possible to detect, in fact. Absolutely. Um, and these results for the for the laws of physics were actually using data from the very large telescope. So I guess big physics, very large telescope in Chile. Any more comments comments on this one? I, I yeah, love no these. Higgs boson, no graviton. <laughs> not this year. No, because... but it's been it's my prediction every year. That they won't we're find not them. doing. We're not doing predictions. This is what <laughs> no, happened this I year. Think it's why Justin, it's you're, you're, you're getting ahead. You're, that's next week's show. Next time. Quiet. <laughs> next time your predictions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that leaves us. We've got number five through number one coming up in the second half of the show. This is the this week in science top eleven countdown of the science news stories of 2010. I'm Dr. Kiki here with Justin Jackson and Greg Yen. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for just a few moments while we have a couple of messages. We'll be right back. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand This week science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I method for all that it's worth and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth because it's this week in science you like audiobooks I know you do and if you do you can get yourself a free one audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 75,000 
thousand different titles. And that's not just in one genre, not just in two genres, but in a multitude of genres. So you can look around and probably find exactly what you're looking for in their library. Twist has found all sorts of wonderful science books in the Audible library to listen to. You can start a free trial today and get any audiobook download of your choice for free. All you have to do is sign up at audiblepodcast.com forward slash twist. That's T-W-I-S. Go to audiblepodcast.com forward slash twist right now for your free download. And the Twist Book Club Book of the Month this month is Apocalypse, Earthquakes, Archaeology, and the Wrath of God by Amos Noor. And you can read along with the Twist Book Club. Head on over to twist.org. You can get your copy. Get yourself a copy of this book. Go to twist.org. Get yourself a copy of the book. Read along. I know you've got some vacation time this month. I know you do. You've got some free time. You're looking for a book to read. Why not Apocalypse? Head on over there. Get yourself a copy of the book and join the conversation. Let me know how you feel about the book. Do you like it? Do you not like it? What do you think about the ideas? I think it's a thought-provoking book. It pits earthquakes against society and culture. broadcast my opinion all over the earth cause it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 i've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news that what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science, you may just not understand it. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to... And we're back, everybody! You're listening to This Week in Science. I'm Dr. Kiki. Justin Jackson's here, and so is Greg Yen. Greg Yen, howdy, holla. Howdy, folks. <laughs> Greg, it's Can awesome to have you here. over the Doctor Who scarf. That's awesome. Uh, it's good. It's good. It was hand-knitted for me, so oh, I have to wear it. <laughs> and if you wear it on camera, it's proof that you wore it. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there you go. <laughs> It's very nice. It's a very nice scarf we like. You know what we're doing? We are doing, uh, we are in the midst of our top 11 countdown. I think we got through number six before we went to the break, and we are now on number five. That's right. Number five is live. Well, it launched anyway. Commercial space flight is on its way, people. SpaceX. They launched their Falcon 9 rocket with the Dragon capsule attached to it really successfully. The corporatization of space has begun. Woo! Oh, yeah. Woo! People have, have equated this event, the launching of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon capsule, with, um, you know, Kitty Hawk, with the first, the first plane that the Wright brothers flew. Um, that it's that big a deal that this is the beginning of something absolutely huge oh well, that's that's a little i mean we've been to space we've been going there for you know 50 years i, just, uh, I mean it's maybe the first you know time somebody could stand in line or go go up to the booth and buy a ticket to go on maybe it's more like that the first commercial air flight but yeah. <laughs> wait we've been we've been going there for a while well the i think the main the main uh point about this this story um and having the dragon nine uh the dragon capsule and the, the falcon nine is that 
is that the U.S. space program, as it was or were, uh, NASA is, is going to be canceling all of its, its shuttle flights, grounding that entire fleet. We're going to be completely dependent upon um, Russian spacecraft to service the International Space Station and other private companies to launch satellites. And so this could per perhaps, you know, take up the slack that's going to be left by the, the shuttle fleet being retired. So in that sense, I think that that's a big story is that, you know, we, the United States hasn't completely dropped off the map in terms of, of being a player in the space industry. So. Which was a, an absolute fear when everyone first heard that the, the space shuttle was going to get grounded. It's like, what are we going to do next? What's going to replace it? Are we going to have to send everyone to to Russia or to France to to launch anything to India? Um, yeah, maybe not. the uh, The SpaceX they are they are I think uh, contracted to NASA to to launch several missions, twelve missions to the space station, which would be great. Let's hope. I, I'm I'm wishing them all the luck because this could be the the start of. <laughs> I don't know. Could be the, the continuation, the start of even more development of commercial space flight and uh, getting more and more people into space. I know it's not Justin's cup of tea, but, you huh? know, oh, a no, lot of people I, are interested. Well, actually, I think it's I, I actually do think it's a brilliant step because I think one of the things that uh, NASA has lacked is um, getting financed for luxury trips into space. And I, I think really it, that could add so much to the the funding of space travel. People wanting to go up and do the weddings and that sort of thing. I mean, we'll we'll keep it on the we'll keep it on the down low here. But uh, <clears throat> zero gravity sex very difficult. It's 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 actually it's not just the the float. It's you know every reaction has this other reaction. It becomes actually it's it's very difficult. Um, you tried. You're, you're speaking from experience. Yes. Uh, zero. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it's just the dynamics when you're up there, like on Earth. We're used to, you know, um, something pushes against something that wants to push back, and they're just pushing up there. You, you get sent up work against the wall, and that, you know, and then it, there's a reaction. You go back the other way. It's it's it would, except for perhaps some uh, some sort of um, bondage sex. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> very, very, no, because you're going to have to strap down and become <laughs> largely immobilized, you know, and or in a very tight area for it to, to you be able to function. And then, and then. A stuff sack. A it's going to be messy. <laughs> it's going to be. <laughs> then on top of that, it's going to be messy because. What normally Justin, can just be contained. We're gonna we're gonna move. We'll we're gonna be floating move along. around you. We're gonna move along getting, from this topic oh. now. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> Moving along. This is your favorite number four. Number four. Humans and and Neanderthals getting it on. This is That's brilliant. Right. So yeah. Tell us about it, Justin. Tell us uh, about okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Just basically, they they um. They, they, uh, I'm not supposed to say the word prediction any more times than this, but uh, <laughs> they found any human whose ancestral group developed outside of, uh, whose genetic lineage developed outside of Africa, or a large portion of it, has between 1% and 4% Neanderthal in their genome in a cross-mating social dating game of spin the stone tool that lasted tens of thousands of years. And uh, all non-African specific uh, genetic lineages contain some gene markers of the ancestral makeout session. Add to this that the genes were found that indicate that Neanderthals uh, had the genetic makeup for lighter skin, reddish hair, and a whole new version and vision of uh, the populations that uh, went outside of Africa and populated Asia and Europe is now developing. So, and this is this is my side note. For any of the minions out there who cringe when I start countering a popular scientific uh, belief with a speculative justification uh, version of the events, go back to the July twenty fifth, two thousand six episode in which uh, we were announcing that the decoding of Neanderthal gene was about to be taken on by the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology. Right. And uh, and hear my comments on what they might find. Mm. 
Mm. Wow, you found the episode 2006, huh? <laughs> And you know, I think there was, I think there was a previous episode too, but it might not have gotten tagged. But because uh, I seem to be reiterating when I listen to that one, I seem to be reiterating uh, a statement uh, that there may have previously been developed. But uh, yeah, all knowing, yeah. Justin, science, all knowing with, with science regards slowly, year by year, catching up with with you, <laughs> with my my intuitive knowledge of everything. <laughs> Greg, what do you think? Was it was it true love between I, the Neanderthals and humans? Well, in response to Justin first, I think that that even a blind quadriplegic squirrel will eventually find a nut every once in a while. So, um, congratulations on finding your nut, Justin. Um, <laughs> Still <laughs> waiting for evidence of the monkey cat. I mean, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> can we can we blame all gingerish? traits in in modern uh, humanity on neanderthals then is that is that the the, the root of all gingerness that's that i think air? some people would like to say that but oh, yeah uh, some people would huh some people would well there is there is a you know i mean it, it does you know, explain I, one of those I claim, mysteries i claim my neanderthal heritage i do <laughs> that I makes you strong it. you know i accept it strong like neanderthal <laughs> Ooh, I'm strong. You like the guns? We're going to a gun show. Well, that's it's <laughs> neat that we have a branch of our of our tree um, branches off and then comes back into the fold again. So it's all nice and tidy. We don't have to wonder where the Neanderthals went. They're all around us, and they probably have red hair. Probably, yeah, and they're much, <laughs> a much shorter people too. Uh, and what's what's kind of interesting is I stockier, noticed this was, shorter and stockier. Shorter and stockier, and I was touring uh, a very ancient um, dwellings in uh, Sweden. They have these villages that are, you know, a thousand years old uh, that uh, they've reconstructed. Uh, so you can sort of do a walking museum tour of throughout different ages. They've assembled these buildings from around Sweden and put them in one location for you to walk through. And one of the most astounding things to me was the beds. Uh, the lengths of the beds are such that people could not have been much more than, um, you know, they, they would have been under five foot. I mean, they were extremely small and the doorways are all very small. Everything is like tiny peopled, right? I'm, I'm tiny, so, but I'm not that tiny. No, no, no. But there is a sort of, you know, and all these <laughs> things play into mythology, too. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know. It could have been the Swedes uh, spawned the idea of dwarves and were, uh, you know, had a good, strong lineage to the Neanderthal. <laughs> it's it, good speculation. It's good speculation. It does, explain, we'll it, see. it does explain, too, because there was there was a lot of questions about the uh, the uh, the sort of uh, lightening of skin, how quickly that uh, sort of developed evolutionarily. Um where we only had, you know, somewhere in the range of 50,000 years for all of Europe and uh, Asia to lose the melanoma in their skin. And uh, having a group that was that was there for 400,000 years of being able to evolve uh, different traits and then, you know, uh, share them and pass them on. So it's a crossbreeding adaptation, not a not simply an evolutionary thing that happens in that that. Sort of Although adaptations like that for skin color can occur over very few generations. There are many, many instances in which change takes place over a very, very short, short period of time. So, you if, know, I wouldn't if, necessarily but, use but that as your genetically, evidence. That's if, you know, if you have those markers in there already, then it makes sense. Then you can be grabbing right, turning, turning stuff off. Of but if you didn't have that previously, then it becomes a lot more difficult. So uh, the idea is that this is something I love, you got the, I'm not buying this at all, Justin. Look, no, but, I'm not. <laughs> but it would it would give it would give the you know, it would give 400,000 years yeah. to uh, to change a genetic code versus, uh, you know, 40, 50,000 years, which is, a, you know, a lot stronger period of time for some some of these changes to take place. Yep. Yep, depends on what you're what you're changing for sure. Oh, show. Um, we're moving on up to number three on our number countdown. Three ocean <laughs> censuses. That's right. This year, 
a 10 year long project was completed. 10 years of sampling our oceans to discover what life exists in the oceans of our planet. 10 years of looking into the deep depths, the deep dark depths of our oceans that we had ignored, that we had not peered into before to try and see what else we live with on our planet. What's here? We know so much more about the this about the space around our planet than we do about the oceans. This is one of the biggest results of of the decade. Um, in addition to uh, just being one of the biggest results of 2010, it involved more than 2,700 scientists, 670 institutions, 540 expeditions, 9,000 days at sea. 30 million observations of 120,000 species. It's pretty, it's pretty substantial. This October, all the results came out. 90% of all marine life, microbes, little tiny bacteria. Mm. And that, uh, let's see, 40% of plankton, has disappeared in the last 30 years. 40% of the plankton. Plankton, so important for enriching our oceans and being the, the basement level of the food chain, disappeared in the last 30, 30 years. Um, but this was, this was one of the uh, most complete surveys that um, has been has been undertaken and there are just some amazing results from it. And it's, it's just great. And there's some great pictures of crazy looking organisms that have never been seen before. We've over the last decade gotten, you know, lots of neat results from this census. And it's great. Good I can't job. It, it took until the year 2000 to, to initiate this census. Um, it, the ocean is makes up such a vast amount of the surface area of our planet, and we know so very little about it. And uh, I'm, so, I'm just kind of shocked, almost more than anything else, that it took it took until the year 2000 to actually get something like this underway. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have like a, a prior years of census data to kind of as a baseline to compare new data to. But you know, we got to start somewhere. So this is this is a really good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. And additionally, I think I think part of what might have taken it so long to get started is, was the advancement in the genetics technology. So the ability to rapidly sequence uh, genomes, specifically bacterial genomes, so that they could stick a bucket into the ocean, pull it out, and then put it through um, uh, various DNA uh, DNA isolation methods to be able to actually sequence the DNA to find out who was there. Uh, before 2000, I mean, we were looking at really slow technology to be able to do that. And it was really during this last decade that the technology advanced to a point that made it, you know, we could do it quick, 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 sequence those bacterial genes. Also, something that's interesting is uh, we've, uh, I think it was the year before this one, uh, that we we came to the discovery that there's a lot of microbes living beneath the ocean floor in the soil and going down thousands of feet to where it was determined by the samples that they'd found that 10% of the organic biomass of planet Earth is actually existing underneath the sea floors. Yeah. So That's many. Deep. Yeah. So there's... <laughs> And there's microbes in the atmosphere, too. I mean, they are absolutely everywhere. They dominate this planet. They own it. They run it. Yep. They run the oceans. If you just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science. We are at number two of our top 11 countdown. Number two. What is number two? What is What could possibly be ahead of all those other things that have come before and is now sitting at number two? What have could we forgotten? Be- what have we forgotten to talk about so far? It's alive! Ish. That's right. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> Good ending on that. Yeah, kind of alive. It's kind, It's alive. It's alive. Uh, not artificial life necessarily, but synthetic life. Synthetic life created by the J. Craig Venter. 
company. I forget the name, the whole name, by Craig Venter. He's in charge of this project. He and his company uh, published in the journal Science that they had created a bacterium, just a single cell organism, uh, by inserting a synthetic genome that had been copied uh, from an existing genome, but created, put together, um, it basically in a dish that it had put been put together synthetically, created. Um, it wasn't organism to organism. It was organism copy blueprint, print blueprint, insert into cell. Cell lives. Mm. Pretty interesting stuff. Very very you know, opened up a lot of questions as to uh, what we were going to be doing with synthetic biology. Where is it going to be going? How far are we going to allow it to go? It even into the pushed ocean. <laughs> into the ocean, right. Um, but it even pushed the United States uh, Congress to uh, in to to investigate and to convene a panel of individuals to vote on how the United States would allow synthetic bi biology to progress. And pretty much they all went, we like synthetic biology. We'll look at it and give it a little oversight, but good on you. Keep going. How does, it, how does it vote? Can we know no, that first? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think, no, I think this is, I think this is one of those things. And I, I've, I've sort of gone uh, out there a little bit on the genetically modified crops um, with the same idea of uh, eventually these are going to leak out. And, you know, eventually some of these synthetic microbes will leak out into the environment, like into the ocean, and they'll be left to fend for themselves and they will go out and develop. And the interesting thing would be, to see if they if they can fare well if there's a way that we can construct them that they'll outdo some of their neighbors and yeah. uh and be able to exist out there that would be kind of that would be a fun experiment to let some loose in the in the ocean and you know, just kind of see what they do well um if we've taken any lesson from agriculture and uh genetic modification in plants we find that oh hey we make those changes it's kind of hard to keep them locked in a laboratory they kind of get out into the wild. So, yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Very interesting to... Uh, uh, you have to appreciate uh, Craig Bentner and the, the fact that he always has his foot down on the accelerator pedal. He's always going a thousand miles per hour. He's not asking a whole lot of questions about where he's going. He just knows that he's going. That's the way that this man seems to pursue science. Is it possible to create a synthetic organism? Well, in, in my mind, I think it is. So I'm going to go ahead and just do it. Before, you know regulation oversight any kind of questions about yeah. ethics morality uh come into play he's he's already way out in front and um and bold yes irresponsible perhaps but this guy this guy's doing stuff and and stuff that could potentially be uh, have an enormous impact on the way in which we live as humans so that's it's mm. that's why it's a big story <laughs> Yeah, I think it's I, I think you're right. I think uh, him moving out and, and doing that, getting the um, you know, just get doing it before the, the regulation and the oversight occur. But at the same time, even though he's going pedal to the metal and he's really pushing the envelope in the field, he's doing it in a, a pretty responsible manner. I mean, they're they're doing it in a way that's not just like, and I'm going to sprinkle these bacteria on the fields or in the ocean just without no, asking anybody. Justin Jackson. You know? Running a that's how, yeah, that's how I do no. it. Totally. Yeah. Let's he's see what like, happens. <laughs> yeah. And so he's doing things and showing that it, I think he's doing it in a responsible manner, showing that it can be done with a, without a lot of federal oversight, that it can be done responsibly if you follow certain uh, certain methodologies. And uh, and I think that that's what the, uh, the congressional panel uh, saw. And they were like, yeah, good job. Let's see more of it. Yeah, that, and also being out ahead of uh, of any anybody else having screwed it up, <laughs> right? So there isn't there isn't law in place yet that, that would prevent him from what he's doing. Um, you know, is a lot of cover because then he doesn't have to have protocols quite the same as if somebody had gone come before and really messed things up in a, in a few times in a few different ways. So there is there is sort of a wild west uh, freedom in what he's doing. And as long as there's no bodies, uh, there's no crime. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right. You know what this brings us to, boys? Number one. The number okay. one story of the entire year. That's right. What you've been waiting for the entire hour. What did we pick? What on earth could be the number one story? Well, it's actually a whole bunch of stories. But the big story, to me, it's NASA. NASA this year. NASA-funded research was just every single show, I think. Almost every single show, there was something from NASA. We we talked about NASA in a never ending. Hang on a sec. I think I think I think Greg is coughing up a hairball. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What is that sound? Uh, that, don't that's move the Don't touch foraging. the mic. The dog foraging. Ah, oh, chasing the cat. You have a house full of. You've got cats, dogs, children. There's like last time I was there, there was a llama. That maybe yeah. is that where you got the with the material for the, the scarf sweater. even? Yeah, the scarf. Exactly. Alpaca. You know, <laughs> it's good, nice and warm. It's <laughs> very itchy. <laughs> but yeah, NASA's been huge this year. What haven't they done? Or what haven't they, what stories haven't they been a part of? I, I I don't know. I'd be hard pressed to actually find the stories that they haven't been a part of. Um just a smattering of the stories that uh were ch just uh, paradigm ch changing this year uh just a just last week two weeks ago two weeks ago we have the funded nasa funded research finding arsenic based life possibly in mono lake of course there are questions being raised by the scientific community but that always happens um it still was published in in science and it's a huge huge finding um no not extraterrestrial life but a pretty huge finding if everything does pan out and and uh, and play out with this research. Big research. Uh, finding the first potentially habitable exoplanet. Goldilocks planet found potentially. Right, right. In the in the nice That's pretty warm awesome. habitable zone, just a little bit bigger than Earth. It would have a heavier gravity, but so many aspects of it could support life. Maybe we could actually, you know, if we destroy this planet, get ourselves on a spacecraft with a nice solar sail that can head us out there. <laughs> <laughs> slowly. Very slowly. Very you know, almost, slowly. Almost more impressive uh, than than the way that, uh, than finding uh, microorganisms organisms that, um, that use uh, arsenic in, as part of their life cycle was the way that NASA PR handled the, the entire event. They leaked news of it or, or news of this finding uh of some finding that would impact um our our concept of of what kind of life exists out in the universe potentially was leaked before like, like almost a full week before the the actual press conference where they actually when they announced that they had found uh microorganisms in lake mono that uh utilize arsenic as part of their life cycle so that was a master stroke to me i think that got people excited about nasa and and what kind of uh uh of findings and, and science nasa does uh sponsor so that that's right. that was right. excellent but it's also yeah. there's part of the backlash against that activity was they they did orchestrate a really uh brilliant public relations reveal uh on the finding but uh, didn't spend that much time getting uh, input from uh, from microbiologists and geneticists to review their work. And there's there are some very serious questions about the methodology that they use. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not the you know, those are those are questions that will come up as people um, uh go into replicating the studies trying to prove or disprove uh that that the the way that their method that their methodologies uh was put together was a good way um their the pr side of it though i mean they did a just they're doing a, such a fabulous job this year at at really making nasa something that's interesting again it's not just oh that organization that lost a mars probe or, oh, they're not just that organization that, um, you know, doesn't have any money and, you know, they're they can't budget. Now they're, they've got all this science that they're doing and all of these amazing discoveries uh, that 
that, that just, I think they're really exciting. I think you're right, Greg. I think the, I mean, this the one story about the arsenic life, uh, the arsenic-based bacteria is just one example of the way that they're pushing to try and make NASA something that is an, a, is considered a useful and interesting organization. Um, they've, they've got so much, so much news out. Um, the Ibex Explorer, the interstellar boundary explorer that looked at the the helio sheath so the the ibex that's looking it, it's looking at where our solar system comes into contact with the intergalactic wind giving us information about how our solar system exists in the universe um you know what was a, another one the nasa's solar dynamics observatory is given amazing images of the sun we were, we're looking at the sun in a way that we've never, ever been able to look at the sun before. Uh, Ten times greater resolution than high-definition television in a broad range of ultraviolet wavelengths. Um, it was launched in Feb on February 11th, and it's the most advanced spacecraft ever designed to study the sun. Um, and then the last uh, story that I picked to cover this, uh, cover that NASA did this year, um, Water on the moon. The lunar lunar crater observation observation and sensing satellite L Cross. Um, it was 2009 that they smashed uh, something into the moon, but the data has come out this year. Uh, in March 2010, ice was discovered on the North Pole, and it seems to be billions of tons of water could be yeah. trapped could be trapped in the in minerals. And in ice sheets, in the that in the, is an the awesome the, find. And that's like billions of tons of water that could support colonies. Right, and, and also the the whole the whole problem with getting bringing water to the moon is that the water itself costs more than its own weight in gold <laughs> to, to <laughs> transport it there. <laughs> so, that, so having it there makes it a much more viable scenario. Yeah, it, the the prospect for a Chinese lunar base has just increased, you know, probably a hundredfold. Um, yeah, and I do believe it'll probably be the Chinese that set up like a the first real lunar base. But um, again, NASA's had had a banner year. They've been able to really capture the the imagination of the public. They've been throwing out um, really tangible results to to the types of types of science that they do uh, in the form of amazing pictures of the universe 14 billion years ago to uh, incredible pictures of saturn's rings to going you know bumping up against the edge of our own solar system it's and i've been you know as the you know this this the centerpiece to their their whole year has been the, this this arsenic organism um, whatever Which you want to call it I am bah humbugging. I'm sorry. I know it's near Christmas. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on my prediction limb, which is I know that's not till tomorrow. Next show, week. Next week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm just I don't have faith in that story, and I don't want to get to okay, a point it's where okay. I am. Where <laughs> I don't want to get to a point though where the enthusiasm for something sciency is actually much more important than the science itself, because right. I feel like then they're infringing on what I do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel threatened by right. this. Okay. Okay. You, NASA, keep to the science. Let <laughs> let Justin deal with the enthusiasm factor. Is that what you're Thank trying you. to say? Here? That's basically that's basically what it comes down to. I feel like they're you know biting on my material a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that about does it for our 2010. Top 11 Science Countdown. Um, it's been a fun hour. Greg, thank you so much for joining us this hour. It was so awesome to have you on the show again. It's been too long. It was an honor. And uh, thanks thanks so much for calling me. And uh, yeah, that, congratulations to you, both of you on 300 podcasts. That's, that's incredible. An astronomical amount of shows. We're building it up. We're getting it up there. We'll 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 have to do another anniversary type show. Does it? Some we'll set another benchmark. We need to celebrate more often. I think. <laughs> totally. More celebrating. Merry Twistmas, everybody. 
It is the Twistmas season, and thank you all for joining us in our Top 11 2010 countdown and for celebrating another year of science with us and for celebrating our 300th show with us. We are we, we will continue doing this. We wish you the best in the new year and especially another year of amazing advances in science. And Justin, didn't we have a song last year or something? Huh? Didn't we have a song like "We wish you a merry Christmas"? We wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas and a sciencey new year. Ah, uh, except this is already this is like Kirsten. When this show actually airs again, it'll be uh, after Christmas. Christmas is the is the season. It's the holiday that keeps on giving. Christmas is in your heart, man. It's not a date on a calendar. <laughs> It's all year round. That's right. And it is available all year round via podcast. You can uh, search for us there in the iTunes directory under This Week in Science. Uh, Also, if you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid, Twist number four Droid app in the Android marketplace. Do we have one of those iPhone apps yet? Are we there or could they just get the iTunes, right? Yeah, you just got to get the iTunes. Do the iTunes. We don't have an iPhone specific app yet. Maybe that'll come this year. Maybe, 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 uh, what is it? Santa Newton <laughs> will, will, will hook us up. For more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available eventually on our website, www.twistwis.org. We also want to hear from you. So email us at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or Justin and or Justin at thisweekinscience.com. Uh, be sure to put twist T W I S somewhere in the subject line, or your your uh, well intended email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also get a hold of us at Doctor Kiki or at Jackson Fly in the Twitter sphere. Uh, we love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover, or address a suggestion for an interview, a topic you would like to hear more about, please let us know. And on next week's show, we're going to have more fun. We're looking back at our predictions from 2010, from the beginning of the year, to see how we did. And we'll make predictions for 2011. Send us your predictions. We want to know what you want to predict, too. What do you think is going to happen in 2011? Email, as Justin said, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or Justin at thisweekinscience. Or did I say that? Yeah, whatever. At thisweekinscience.com with the subject, Twist 2011 Predictions. We're going to be back here next week, and uh, we hope you'll come back, too. Join us again for more great science goodness. And if you have learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> this Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand This week science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I method for all that it's worth and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth cause it's this week in science this week in science this week in science science science, science. this week in science this week in science this week in science science, science. science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just not understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything and if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye, 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 e
This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. <laughs> From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science.